two other items first. To begin. Hello and welcome to the Baycrest Behavioral Support Rounds. For those of you who don't know me, once again, my name is Kara McCannuel. I'm the clinical manager for the Baycrest Behavior Support Outreach Team. Today, uh, the Behavioral Support Rounds is entitled Caring Across Sectors, a PSW Perspective. Just a couple of things to go through first. Um, so the land of acknowledgement. Although we are meeting virtually, we acknowledge that Baycrest and our related Toronto Central Behavior Support Programs operates on the traditional territory, territories of many Indigenous nations, which have cared for the land for thousands of years, including the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat peoples. And we recognize the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land today. You may live and work in different territories, so we encourage you to reflect on the land on which you are located and to consider, consider your relationship to the land and to the people who are the traditional keepers of the land. Um, I would like to review some participant guidelines. So this session is being recorded, um, as you would have heard, and will be archived on the Ontario CLRI and BSO websites. Your microphone is automatically muted. We will have 40 minutes of presentation, followed by about 15 minutes of discussion and a wrap up. Please place any questions you have in the Q&A. If you have questions related to, to tech support, please message Agnes. So you'll see Agnes is um, listed, Agnes Cheng um, Talis. Um, for those of you interested in receiving a certificate of attendance, please enter your name and email in uh, the completed evaluation form, which will come at the end. Um, Agnes uh, has also um, said that she, at the end, when uh, the group is actually asking for any feedback or stories, you can use the hand emoji. If you put your hand up and use that emoji, she can unmute you that way. Um, so you'll, you'll be cued by our presenters at that time. So without further ado, I wanted to um, introduce our presenters who are near and dear to me because they're actually um, some of my staff members for the Baycrest um, BSO program. And I can see the, the typo already, sorry about that, Simone. So clinician leader, um, Simone Cumberbatch, um, who is an occupational therapist by background, Lob St. Chodon, who's an RN for our behavior support outreach team, and our wonderful BSO um, PSW team leads, Lulu, um, Abraha, Bavora, Booth, Matthews, and Veronica Downer. Um, this team, uh, again, is part of our behavior support outreach team. They focus on the west end of the team, uh, the, the subregions. So without further ado, I'm going to swap it over to you guys if you want to start sharing Agnes for the team. Thanks so much again, Agnes, for sharing for us. And Agnes, if we can put it in presenter mode. Fantastic. So thank you everyone for coming and making the time to be with us today. Uh, we want to thank you for your time and energy that you're giving uh, while we've completed our presentation. We hope for um, interaction um, at the end, uh, but feel free to write any questions you have during and hopefully we'll provide you with something that is worth listening to during that time. Next slide. So the, these three slides that we're gonna go through quickly, they're just to let you know that we have no disclaimers, uh, we have no uh, conflicts of interest, and we have no uh, support in terms of financial support that we've been provided to give you this presentation. So we're able to flip through these three slides coming up, Agnes, pretty quickly. This one, and then this one, and then the next one. Mm -hmm. And now we're to our overview. Thank you so much. So this presentation time is gonna run about 45 minutes or so. We hope by the end, like we said, if there's any questions that you have, but also really hopeful that if you have any stories or thoughts or experiences of your own working across the sectors and the different silos that you'll feel comfortable to share them with us because this is quite a qualitative presentation meaning that it's largely based on our own experiences. So as a quick and brief review, we're gonna very quickly move through a reminder of how much the BSOC team has grown and changed over the last year. We're gonna give some background related specifically to the West End sector and what it's like to work within that context. And then we're gonna move to our major theme of the day, which is the PSWs and their experiences. We'll start by briefly discussing why we decided to highlight the PSW's voices, and then I'll pass it over to the PSW's on our team themselves to talk over with you some successes and challenges that they've experienced while working in the BSOT, now that we're covering a wider sector, um, sectors as a one team model. 
In this case, we've divided it into long-term care, retirement home, and private residences within the community. And then Lob Sang and I will share uh, success stories of our own, which highlight the great work that the PSWs do within these communities. And we'll wrap up with lessons learned and some hope for the future. Next slide. So to start, let's look back on how far we've come. The BSO launched into a new and exciting period of growth as an organization, as a service provider. We have solidified longstanding partnerships with multiple sectors, including COS, LOFT, the Alzheimer's Society, and the EDs. Our teams within the long-term care and community have merged and then doubled in number. Um, we have new expectations around wait list, new processes, new pathways, new documentation, and new assessments, as well as new schedules of care, all of which we hope will provide increased coverage and support to the populations that we traditionally serve. Next slide. And boy, did we grow. <laughs> There's been some immense growth on our team as they merge, merge and expanded. So that includes a more robust triage team, the increase um, in care navigators, greater admin assistance, medical support provided by our new um, MP, a caregiver support specialist, an educator, a research coordinator, the new BSS role and more. All of this happened within about four months. <laughs> so it's been a rigorous time for our teams as we have this growth spurt and welcome new members. And our management has done an amazing job of steering the ship through these uncharted waters. But um, this presentation is gonna focus specifically and qualitatively on how these changes impacted the PSWs on our teams. Um, and even more specifically, the PSWs on the West End. Uh, I did mention to uh, some of the other clinical leaders that as we were making this, we got excited at the thought of hearing what other PSWs thought um, about in, in the other regions and in long-term care as well. So we think it's an incredible idea um, as a nudge nudge. If any of the other teams want to join or have another presentation that incorporates all the PSWs voices, uh, we'd be happy to do that as well. But for now, it's about us. So we're going to go to the next slide and introduce ourselves as a team. So um, meet the BSOT West End team. Like Kara says, it's made up of myself as the clinical leader, Lob Sang as our RN, and our PSWs, Mulu, Bavora, and Veronica. Similar to our sister geographies in BSOT, most of us had worked together or alongside each other, or at least seen each other in some capacity once or twice before we became a team. But we had no idea who the members of the new geographic teams would be when we were having that big growth until we started working together. So each of the West, uh, Midwest, East, North teams, uh, Mid-East teams, we, we all met each other for the first time when we kind of came together as our new teams. And uh, this was a time for growth, but also a time to get to know each other and to adjust to the changes of being on a new team. Next slide. And so on top of having a new team for us to get to know, we also had to get to know in terms of our region, our new geographies. Although many of us had worked in the West End long-term care sector before, none of us had any experience working in the community in the West End region. So for our particular team, that meant getting to know each other as well as getting to know a new community region. So that included trying to forge partnerships with home and community care, um, their managers, adult day programs, family health teams, acute care partners, loft services, um, supportive houses, retirement homes, and more. We're still in the process of exploring and settling in and really getting to know the region. But so far, it's been a great process to go through together because we tend to go to these new areas as a group and introduce them to ourselves and what we can provide as a BSOT team. Next slide. So to very quickly um, let you know what it's like working in the West End, we have uh, four main health centers. That's West Park, Runnymede, St. Joe's, and CAMH. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we see that we have uh, seven long-term care homes, Lakeshore, Copernicus, West Park, Norwood, White Eagle, Lakeside, and Elm Grove. And there's an eighth home that's being built right now that will be added to the list as well. Next slide shows our regions. So our boundaries are based on the historic boundaries as set up by the Lynn, the Toronto Central Lynn historically. So this includes a boundary through we meet and kiss with our uh, busy Midwest uh, sister team. And then our boundary stretches north to um, Eglinton, 
back down south to Lakeshore and then east to Islington Avenue. The West region encapsulates two main neighborhood groupings. That's Etobicoke High Park and Parkdale West Downtown. These two groupings give a good example of what it's kind of like to work at the West End. So if we go to the next slide, we can think a little bit about the High Park um, Etobicoke region. So the High Park Etobicoke region, when it's compared to the Toronto Central Inn on a whole, actually has a lowered percentage of total immigrants when we compare it. It also has a higher percentage of persons living with university degree degrees, a higher percentage of people um, who aren't low income, a higher percentage of older population. So we're looking at a place where we often see some um, higher economic status individuals. So we get a lot of uh, retirement homes there that are privately housed, such as the Grenadier, Kingsway, Scarlet Heights. But it also means that we have a high percentage of aging population. So the West, uh, the West End also, when compared to the Toronto Central Lynn, has a higher degree of persons living with long-term chronic illnesses, such as osteoarthritis, heart disease, dementia, and secondary to stroke. Now, when we move over to the Parkdale um, West downtown region on the next slide, we see a different kind of the other side of the West End. So when compared to the Toronto Central Inn as a whole, this neighborhood has a higher level of new immigrants and a higher level of persons who do not speak English. When compared to the rest of the city average, it has a higher level of low income families, a higher instance of persons without a secondary education, and a higher incidence of use of the emergency department for issues which could have been addressed elsewhere. And in these regions, that's where we see a lot of our um, shelters, assisted living, halfway houses, and loft supportive housing. Um, and on the next slide, we can see where, even though we have these kind of two faces, what keeps us busiest in the West End is that they have a really high percentage um, population of aged individuals. So when we're working with our home and community care partners, they highlight to us that they have a population at home and community care in the West of over 3,000 clients. And of those clients, over 40% are over the age of 85. And of those 40%, 85% um, have long-term care applications in place. So we do have a high percentage of older adults needing support and care in that area. That's just to give you an idea of where the PSWs have been doing a lot of this good work. So sometimes I'm sure for them, it can feel like they're in really high-end retirement home buildings or, some, um, or, or within lower socioeconomic status housing and thinking, oh, these look like two really different faces, um, but all those faces come together to make the West End. On the next slide, we can think a little bit about why out of all of the different team members, and we've got so many more of them now on our team, have we decided to spotlight PSW voices? Well, I number one, it just seems like a really good idea. <laughs> and number two, it's because there's quite a lot of research that's been done specifically in the GTA and in Ontario, which has been doing exactly that. Um, there's a study in 2022 that was specific for, again, for the GTA. The link is down there at the bottom if you want to read more about it. And it talks about how on the healthcare teams, when they've done both qualitative and quantitative research, that it's always the PSWs who seem to be most precariously employed with the lower wages that can sometimes keep them in poverty. They're also facing poor work conditions that have detrimental um, effects on their physical and mental health if they're not supposed um, fully supported. And a lot of that information came out secondary to, no surprise to anybody, the pandemic and how many shortages in terms of actual staffing numbers, in terms of um, PPE um, and the kind of workspace expectations that occurred during that time. In fact, a study that was done in 2021 that was pretty focused around the pandemic and was keeping an eye on the numbers of um, PSWs who were leaving that role um, gave us some pretty stark numbers as related to that. So if we move to the next slide, we can see that that um, that study, which was published in the Globe and Mail, it ad advises that there's a good chance that by um, 2028, we'll be short uh, in Ontario about 33,000 PSWs and nurses if we keep on the track that we're going on. And when they, were, when they did um, some research into asking over I think it was over 4,000 PSWs took part. Um, why are we why are we seeing this this kind of 
movement away from the role, 50% of the PSWs at that time, and this was just last year, were only staying in the field for about five years, and then they would move on to other employment. Um, and when they did further research into that, they found that 43% of the uh, persons who were saying, I think I'm going to go, listed burnout as a big reason for why they decided to move on to other employment. Um, turnover at the end of the day was highlighted uh, based on three major issues. One being the pay, um, two being the working conditions. But that also included the fact that a large percentage of these PSWs were only hired part-time or casual, which made it really hard for them to maintain consistent employment. Um, but the number one reason, again, that was listed for why people are, uh, were leaving that role as a PSW was because of burnout and that being the highest factor. So um, with that kind of as a context, as well as us moving into a bigger team with bigger expectations, we thought it's a good time for us to start listening to the PSWs and our teams as well to make sure that their voices are being heard. On the next slide, you can see a pretty robust list, and I've snatched this right out of a presentation that Kara gave, and it outlines all of um, those new expansions of the PSW role, because the PSWs on our team do a lot. So um, from what they were doing before, they've had and taken on new responsibilities, new skills, new expectations around documentations and the kind of assessments they can do. and um, our PSWs on the West End team were the first ones to step out of their comfort zone of working in long-term care, which they've done for a very long time, and said, yep, throw us in, um, and offered to come into the community with me to try this new sector, um, despite how challenging and sometimes scary those big changes can be. Um, I was really impressed and inspired by their openness and willingness to just get out there and try from the very start. Um, and I think that the PSWs that we work with um, on the BSOT often really do kind of define that new title that they've just got called uh, the PSW team leads. So if we move to the next slide, we see here our PSW team leads. <laughs> so I'm very excited at this time because not just because I get to stop talking, but also because um, this is what the presentation is really about, allowing the PSWs a chance to speak for themselves. So um, to introduce the PSWs, uh, we have Mulu and we have Bavora and we have Veronica. I put the number of years that they've been working um, on the team and at Baycrest, just because I think it's so impressive, especially when we read statistics that about 40% of PSWs leave after the first year. We've got a 15 to 20 years of experience um, on our team. And this is very common for a lot of the PSWs across our geographic regions. So our PSW leads are now going to review some of the positives and challenges that we've come up with as a team while they've been working on those three sectors that we've identified. So we're going to start by talking about the long-term care where we've historically been. Um, and then the next step was the retirement home, which is kind of the first place that the PSWs got out there and kind of cut their teeth. And then the next um, comparison is going to be in the community, which is the newest kind of um, environment that we've had our PSW leads working within. So um, if we move to the next slide, I believe that the first PSW speaking will be Bavora. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity to speak today about the um, positives that we experience in working in long-term care as the BSOT team, part of the BSOT team. While within the LTC homes, the PSWs have great experience. We see, though, um, you know, PSWs have high uh, rate of turnover, we can see, we I have um, experienced PSWs that work within the home for a long time. And because of the experiences, they, um, they are able to work confidently and um, in terms of skill and knowledge working within that setting. Also in long-term care, there are multiple teams that we encounter. And um, these teams are um, that there's access to doctors, 
nurses, OT, PT, social workers, PSWs, of course, you have activation and you have the PRCs. And having these um, uh, multiple teams, that gives us access whenever, you know, say for instance, we would want to engage someone um, in activities where we know where to go. And so that is uh, very important having um, all these um, different teams in the one place. We also have the um, mobile team such as ourselves that are coming in the home that can collaborate with, with staff and just make it even better for the people that live there. And as I said, when these teams are, when these resources are needed, because they're in one place, it makes it accessible. Working, also working in the LTC home, we're never alone when we go in there. We are always having someone that we can call on. And so this is very, very important for us going into these homes. The many um, multidisciplinary teams are there to support um, the assessments and the care plan implementation that might be needing to be established. Um, additionally, the role of the BSO lead, such as ourselves, is established. The teams understand that we come in there as consultants and they learn to work alongside us. The clients in the LTC home, that's another positive for the most part are safely housed. And the affordability and costs are not barriers um, that will limit what can be provided there. And to say that, you know, when once a, a person is um is admitted or go to live in long-term care. The um, it's not like other areas of care where, you know, they have to pay extra. Once they're admitted, most of the services there are covered, and so they don't need to think about extra for what you know can be covered as they live there. Some challenges we might find in um, in the long-term care home when we go in. So some of the challenges are the high turnover rate of staff, like you go in there and you're not meeting the next person the next day. And so those people might need to learn who we are again. And so some of the some are some of those are, are challenges that we face. And even PSW and nurses that change units often. And these um, sometimes even leave the unit or even leave the home totally, or even leave the field as we have experienced over the pandemic. This is also the case with our valued um, partners. May, the main contacts at the LTC home, the BSO leads. We, we can say we have experienced a lot of turnover in this area. Some people come and we're getting used to them and we have to learn to get used to others as they you know come and go. But so far, I believe if I speak for myself, we just up and get acquainted and continue the work. And of course, the challenges are there, but we learn to just be resilient and continue to work. Another challenge within the LTC home, there are different cultures. And um, 
these cultures, we have to learn to, we have to learn those cultures in order to be able to help these um, people. And so, and even within the same facility, you, from, from unit to unit, there might be differences with how the care and the work is done. And again, we have to learn to adapt and understand that workplace or that unit. Another challenge, the high demand around care and often the ratio of client to staff. And this means that the LTC staff can often, often don't have time to engage us because they have to focus on client care first. And so we see these challenges as we work alongside them. And lastly, lastly, we have transitions. So transitions from hospital is especially um, notably the gaps that are there with transitions. Because when um, <clears throat> residents or clients are admitted to the LTC homes, there are gaps in the information about them. Some And some of it, we um, have such challenge, we never find out. But when you have transitions coming from, let's say, um, Toronto Rehab or even Baycrest, we have those information coming with clients and we're able to effectively help the home to help that client settled, settle. But notably from hospital, that is one of the big challenges that we face. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, for, so for retirement homes on this slide for the positives, um, we're gonna have Veronica speak. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening on here. Uh, um, so for some of the positives um, in the retirement home, uh, which uh, our, our theme has found that going into retirement home has been like an easy step down from long-term care homes work. And also many of the skills and knowledge gained from long-term care homes can be used as well within the retirement home. There are few PSW staff, for one thing, and on some of the memory care units, there are also nurses. So that's that was really positive uh, in terms of, you know, supporting people with dementia uh, and for the environment and safety. Uh, oh, I lose my slide here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, due to the manner in which retirement homes are set up, uh, there is really uh, occasions, rarely occasions when uh, I lose my slide. I'm losing my slide there, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, please tell me when to change to the next yeah. slide. Okay, I'm still on the uh, positives, <laughs> sorry. Um, Angie says that, that that the slides themselves were disappearing. Yeah. I don't know if you can see it, the slides themselves were, were going away. They're back now, though. Um, and we're on the slide okay. previous. Yeah. So due to the, the manner in which retirement homes are set up, there is rarely occasions when, uh, when PSWs uh, will be alone with the clients, alone within the space, which has helped us to feel safer in the retirement home. Uh, so entering into the community and within that setting, setting is fairly safe for us. And I feel for myself, I can speak for myself that I've always felt safe once I started um, visiting them. There also uh, seems to be less work-based pressure on the PSWs in retirement home, allowing them a little more time to speak with the uh, uh, you know, with, with us, uh, with the BSO team, when we go in, and as it is notably um, completely institutional setting, clients have more, it's not 
completely an institutional setting. So clients have more level of independence and ability to choose what they they want to do within their their time and and bodies and and in their space. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges, uh, as far as challenges, this um, still remains a new um, experience for PSWs, which does come within new challenges to work around. Uh, there are uh, restrictions and which kind of strategies can, uh, can be used within the retirement home. Example, medications are generally not allowed to be eaten in foods per se, like uh, in, in retirement home, um, long, sorry, long-term care home, um, that's a practice, but in the retirement home, it's not allowed. Uh, there are no white codes for one thing. So uh, if there's an issue and we need uh, either the, the retirement home PSWs or VSO, we wouldn't have that um, support. Um, there are limitations in the support and care equipment, such as OIR, there are no OIR lifts in retirement home, uh, transfer boards, etc. Uh, there are often occasions when clients due to their eye care needs who are bed bound and never leave their, their bedrooms due to lack of uh, these com complex devices. Uh, so, you know, it, the, this is like no quality of life when we look at it. So um, that's one of the, the challenges for, for the staff to manage those care. As retirement home are not set up to manage this level of high care needs. And as such, these devices are not in place. In, in retirement home. Also, although there are retirement homes which have many, uh, not really many, but have memory or locked unit, many retirement home residents live on free units, in which cases residents are wandering free. Uh, you know, they have space and, and face higher risk of being able to enter into the community, which, which present harm and very risky. Uh, and further, there are limits, limited resources such as occupational therapists, physiotherapists, social workers, etc. And as part of the retirement home care and overall, less staffing. Results again in strategies, options being limited in, in this situation. Also, there are multiple organizations to coordinate care with uh, the HCC SS or um, agencies, retirement home staff are often work under time pressures as there is not, uh, and have eye turnover in staff. And also private PSWs in place as well. Finally, due to costs associated with uh, retirement homes and private care, this often make uh, finances an aspect of barrier around care and uh, care utilization. Thank you. And then lastly, we'll have uh, Mulu uh, speak on the next two slides, which outline some of the positives and like challenges that we found and talked about as a team as related to working in the community and private residences, and that is persons um, homes that aren't in a retirement home setting. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. I am Mulu, I'm the West, is, uh, the West team, PSW team lead. Today, I want to talk to you about the community, specifically in the private homes. For most of us, when we think about aging, we wish to be able to age in a place with our homes and with our families. For the clients we see within the community, this is what their families are trying to provide. This is often more personalized care within the home and more freedom to provide care in a cultural, specific, and sensitive manner in keeping with the client's long-standing way of life. This includes being around family and being cared for by loved one who you know 
and familiar with. It is also good to be able to see client within the home and natural environment is as you get to better ideas of who they are and who they were. And by the large, the family is grateful for the support and service. Next slide. However, there are many challenges around working in the community. As you can tell by the slide, having the most points. In the community, we often see more than just the behavioral challenges. There are issues like housing, resource limitation, financial burden, and family dynamic with cause complication and caregiving. Many family members are doing their best, but are extremely burnt out and are trained as a caregiver. And as such, there is a large need for education. There are limited resource or wait lists for services. HCCSS PSWR restricted in the hours of care they can provide and often families can't afford to supplement with the private care. Overall, the situation is usually more emotional as the family are invested in their lo loved one, but might not understand the limitation of the system and have high demands and can become frustrated when they can't be met. This provides, these private homes are not set up with hospital beds and wheelchair ramps and hoyer and et cetera. And as a such clients can also become trapped on the floor or in a bedroom. And often family are fearful of the unknown and as scared to even consider long-term care home, even if it might provide the client with the potentially higher level of care. Thank you for listening. Then if we move to the next slide, it's just gonna be a, a very quick story. So not a full case case scenario, but a quick story that kind of outlines a lot of those points that Malou was talking about in the community. Um, we're gonna have Veronica just talk about without obviously using identifiers about a case that she kind of stepped into. Again, it won't be the full case, but just kind of what she noticed even from the first visit. So, uh... Yeah, so we talk about community often involves more than behavior management. And in this case, uh, where family members, uh, spouse and, and daughter, they're uh, working full time and the, the, the perception around care and who is uh, providing care, uh, family are already getting PSWs from the community twice, uh, twice a day and just for one hour. And resident, the client is going into um, adult day program for three days and need to be picked up in the afternoon. And so there's an issue, family dynamics, who, who is going to be available to, to receive client. Um, so when PSW, myself, PS, well, PSW were involved, um, there was some misconception of uh, my role, what's going to happen, because I need not to be there alone with the client. Uh, so a lot of conflicted um, reports within the home. Um, family are able to manage behavior. They needed someone in the home um, five days a week, <laughs> both PSWs and, and, and uh, community um, day programs. Um, in the end, um, we were able to resolve the issues around the care and who is responsible. And, and, and of course, family members and youngest um, in the family should not set up for, um, taking on role as the client needed. And, uh, you know, there, there was uh, initial uh, query regarding potential abuse by resident not getting her needs met. And so our team were able to support the family in that sense where we um, unhold with the case, if they need um, behavior support, we are here, still here to support them. Thank you. 
Thank you, Veronica. So Veronica's story kind of highlights how um, even from the, the beginning of stepping into the um, the home, it wasn't so much the behaviors that were a challenge, but all the expectations and the family dynamic around whose responsibility is it to take care of this person and how could we afford it um, so that our team within the first few uh, visits didn't get to speak much about the behaviors because they weren't actually the main um, issue that was occurring in the home. But to move now to a success story, um, in the retirement home, I had a client who was living there with her spouse, um, who was 101 years old, and he was amazing and sharp-witted. So it's always nice to hear stories where seniors are aging um, without dementia, because that happens as well, uh, even though we don't get to see them very often. And they were pretty well set up. Uh, it's one of those lucky stories in the West End for High Park region, where they were pretty well set up financially. They worked, they lived in a retirement home. They had a private PSW, as well as home and community care support services as PSWs, as well as the retirement home staff. But the biggest issue was physical and verbal resistance to care. And it was mostly the private PSW who was um, experiencing trying to provide uh, personal care, trying to stop this client from wandering and exit seeking and leaving the home. And she was very unstable on her feet. So they were also dealing with um, multiple falls. So we came in and there was a crisis application in place and it was at a place where everybody thought, okay, this person's gonna have to move to long-term care right away uh, because they're just not safe. But if we move to the next slide, we see that, um, yes, we did a full BSOT assessment and we spoke with the family and um, we, the PSWs and we got the retirement home staff on board. There was education and we even brought in our nurse MP to talk about advanced care planning. But the biggest, uh, I think, benefit was when we had our PSW come in and she worked with the private PSW very closely, doing observation, coaching and education. And at the end of the day, the thing that had made the big difference is that the private care PSW now felt really confident to take care of the client. So she said, it's okay. I'm able to bathe her most of the time now. She's a lot calmer now um, and I'm I'm good to stay put. She's she's doing better overall. Um, and when she was able to tell that to the family, the family said, well, okay, if, if you're comfortable to stay put and the, the spouse who's 101 is a lot less stressed now because mom's stress level has gone all the way down. The client is calmer in general. We were able to ensure that that client could continue to not just be in the home, but with the help of the nurse MP, set up a care plan for palliation so that she could be in the home long term unless there was acute illness. So it was definitely a big success, but I feel like the huge turnaround was when our PSW really helped the private care PSW build her confidence in taking care of that client's needs. And now we're going to have a quick review of a success story from the long-term care homes, because that's the work that we've traditionally done. Um, and we, we never want to forget where we came from and the great work we continue to do. So we can move to the next slide. And that will be Lobsang. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lobsang. I'm the RN from BSOD, uh, Baycrest. I want to thank Kara and uh, Simone for giving this opportunity to me to share this LTC success story. So the case uh, that I have is about the transitional support. So the uh, referral received for 71 year old female with dementia with BBSD and a delusional disorder admitted from acute care hospital with a history of previously exit seeking while admitted at acute care hospital. So the history is about the resident is she's single, never married, she have no kids, have a brother and sister who visit at uh, LTC home. She worked as a secretary in Northern Railway. So resident was, uh, was admitted at LTC on the secure unit, however, was experiencing daily behavior, verbal and physical aggression towards co-resident and staff. Uh, specifically after co-resident who are, who are wandering, screaming, entering into her room. Resident would get extremely upset and would scream and yell at co-resident and staff. So the uh, resident uses a cane and staff were worried that she might use cane as a weapon. So, uh, so the possible risk is she might use her cane as a weapon. So 
LTC Home provided one-on-one -on -one staff to support residents during this transition time, priority uh, to be sought involvement for observation. Resident does not like having people watching her, peeking at her, doing things for her by a one-on-one -on -one staff. As she was single, she was a very private person. So BSOT was involved, initial assessment was done, PSW, uh, BSOT PSW was booked to uh, support the smooth transition and observe the behaviors and find triggers and successful intervention. So BSOT findings and suggestions are, resident is cognitively high function, is independent in most ADLs. Sometimes she needs a reminder of her daily routines and she can express her needs and wants. Resident is slowly uh, adjusting to a new environment, but according to the BSOT PSW observation, she wasn't exit seeking and she was not observe wandering. Resident is very private person, was frequently observed being irritated by other residents who wandered to her room. Resident also frequently complains about other clients' actions. She, she stated once in the dining room. Uh, in the dining room, one resident coughs constantly and another resident screams loudly, repeatedly during mealtime. That is disturbing and making me angry. So B sought PSW supported resident by listening, providing validation, and promptly responding to her needs. B sought PSW also noted that resident does not like to socialize with co-resident due to her higher cognitive function. So triggers were already captured that co-resident who are wandering, screaming, and coughing uh, are triggering this co-resident. So BSOT recommendation was uh, resident would benefit moving to another unit where resident can enjoy her independent uh, and space. And also she can make friends to socialize and do activities throughout the day. So BSOT, uh, this recommendation was uh, um, communicated to behavior lead and the behavior lead was able to discuss with the team about the BSOT recommendation about internally transferring this resident to a non-secured unit to re reduce responsive behaviors. So resident was internally transferred to non-secured unit and was provided a wonder guard for extra safety. And since the internal transfer, resident has not had one behavior outburst and has adjusted very well on her new unit. So BSO lead was very appreciative and thank to BSOT's involvement and suggestion. This resident is now happily living on another unit and has not had one single behavior since. Thank you, Lapsang. So if we thank you our, our last two slides, um, they're just two very quick. We want to leave time for stories, so I'm going to make sure I get through this quickly. Um, is just to to highlight what have we learned. So. The major takeaways of what's resonated with most of our team since we started working together is that firstly, we found um, that it's best when the PSW and the clinician or the RN go into the community together for the first visit. This isn't including retirement home uh, because retirement homes are set up in such a way that they're safer, there's more people and there's a more understood expectations around PSW roles from our team. But for safety reasons and to make sure that the right tone is set for the families, our team has agreed that anytime a PSW goes into the community, we always do that first visit together and then we negotiate with the family as a team. Um, we've also found that we're very mindful of the environments that we're going to send the PSW into. So while we're all very comfortable when our PSW leads go into retirement homes, um, I do take pause to go, okay, if I'm going to a lost assisted living housing, um, live, lost assisted living home, I know that there might be a little more unsafety due to bed bugs or um, homeless population or transient population or where is the extra support going to be? Are they going to be in the spaces on their own? So in uh, locations like that, again, we tend to go together or I'm a little more careful about when and where I do send them. Um, we also always make sure that during our meetings, we take the time to discuss scheduling together. And 
this bleeds into how important communication is and how important every voice is. For example, if we send a PSW out for a morning shift and then they come back and tell me, you know what, I don't think this person needs to be seen during the morning. I think they need to be seen during the afternoon. Then we'll shift them over. If um, we go in and our PSW says, you know what, they're saying that the major behavior is this, but when I was there, I saw this. We really make sure that every voice is heard and we believe our PSWs when they come back and tell us things. And we wrap that into our scheduling. Um, so a, a big thing that came out for us was the importance of trust, that we trust each of our members as professionals to not just give recommendations of care, but to coordinate care. And then of course, communication. We do that via email, we do it via phone calls, and we have a text group so that we're always in constant contact with each other in case we need support to run something by each other or to discuss around scheduling. So lastly, on the last slide, what we hope for in terms of the future for our team, but also bigger as well, is that we want to, number one, make sure that there's optimal utilization of the PSWs. We want to make sure how to either build on or expand roles to include weightless management or care progression or something we still try to come up with as a team. But we want to make sure that we're using our skilled team members, our PSW leads, to the best of their advantages. We already have one of our PSWs, Veronica, trialing alternating between days and evenings um, every other week to see if we have more, that gives us more options in terms of observation times. We also know that with those expanded roles that the T PSWs will continue to need further education and further training, just to ensure that they're capable and confident with any new addition of skill. And from the PSWs themselves from my team, there's been an interest in more training around chronic disease management training for something like arthritis to make sure we're moving bodies in the right way when we're doing transitions and transfers and to better understand what are these, because like we said in the West, there's lots of heart conditions and, and um, pain, chronic pain. So the PSWs have an interest in making sure they better understand these positions, these conditions. And one of the things that that highlighted um, is a request for being able to have um, or be provided with really reliable sources where they can go to to educate themselves. So if they're working with a client that has um, a particular illness, sometimes that illness or diagnosis is the symptom that they're there to manage. An example of which is a client that kept um, shaking and dropping things. And this was listed as a behavior. Um, but when the PSW did research into that condition, it turned out that that's actually a symptom of that very specific condition, that kind of shaking and impulsivity. So they did highlight the importance of being able to know where do I go to to get good information so that I can educate myself about the clients that I'm seeing uh, because they've got a hunger for that. So we move in. That's kind of the end of our um, presentation. I think we went a little bit over, but hopefully there's still time for a few questions. Like Kara said, you can put it in the Q&A, you can put it in the chat, or if you'd actually like to speak, uh, if you raise your hand, um, then Agnes can unmute you. Um, it doesn't have to be a question. It can also be a story um, or anything that you'd like to share with the team. Thank you so much. Thank you, West and BSOT team. So again, if you have any questions about today's pre presentation or questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A as Simone said, or use the hand emoji emoji to uh, be unmuted. I don't know why it's not sharing on my end, sorry. In the chat box. So it stated on one of your slides that you're looking at training for documentation. Is that in long-term care? Um, it's just kind of a, over the, um, over and above in terms of PSWs. Before uh, the PSWs roles were kind of more set, so their documentation was very um, focused on ABC charting because that's what helps the RNs and um, us as clinicians to understand what they saw and what they did. And it's really a gold standard for knowing what went on in terms of behavior. But now they're doing so much more as well. They're like building rapport. They're speaking with families. They're doing observations. There's the potential that they'll start 
um, doing some of our personhood assessments as well. So with all this expanded roles, we also need to make sure that um, our PSW leads know how do I document all this um, wealth of information that I'm getting, both in the long-term care and in the community. Um, so that documentation um, training will probably be an internal thing for us um, in terms of the BSO and Baycrest, but ultimately will help everybody as, as we all learn to make sure that we're documenting to our standards. Great. And our BSOD addiction specialist has great presentation, demonstration of um, work, uh, wonderful teamwork, a couple of thank yous. Thank you, team, for sharing. Good work. Uh, we only have about five minutes left. Any other questions or any other um, stories that somebody would like to share in terms of the PSW perspective? Leave it another minute in case somebody is uh, typing in the chat box. Okay. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you to the presenters for a really valuable um, presentation showing a different perspective. Um, just a quick reminder that if you would like a certificate of attendance, please complete the brief evaluation survey, which will be emailed to you afterwards. The recording for today's session will be available on the Ontario CLRI and BSO websites. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.